Author's Preface of Good Sense, or Free Thoughts Opposed to Supernatural Ideas, by Paul Henri Thierry, Baron Dolbach. Translator Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Good Sense or Free Thoughts Opposed to Supernatural Ideas, by Paul Henri Thierry, Baron Dolbach. Translator Unknown, the author's preface. When we examine the opinions of men, we find that nothing is more uncommon than common sense. Or, in other words, they lack judgment to discover plain truths or to reject absurdities and palpable contradictions. We have an example of this in theology, a system revered in all countries by a great number of men, an object regarded by them as most important and indispensable to happiness. An examination of the principles upon which this pretended system is founded forces us to acknowledge that these principles are only suppositions, imagined by ignorance, propagated by enthusiasm or knavery, adopted by timid credulity, preserved by custom which never reasons, and revered solely because not understood. In a word, whoever uses common sense upon religious opinions, and will bestow on this inquiry the attention that is commonly given to most subjects, will easily perceive that religion is a mere castle in the air. Theology is ignorance of natural causes, a tissue of fallacies and contradictions. In every country it presents romances void of probability, the hero of which is composed of impossible qualities. His name, exciting fear in all minds, is only a vague word to which men affix ideas or qualities, which are either contradicted by facts or inconsistent. Notions of this being or rather the word by which he is designated, would be a matter of indifference if it did not cause innumerable ravages in the world. But men, prepossessed with the opinion that this phantom is a reality of the greatest interest, instead of concluding wisely from its incomprehensibility that they are not bound to regard it, infer on the contrary that they must contemplate it without ceasing and never lose sight of it. Their invincible ignorance upon this subject irritates their curiosity. Instead of putting them upon guard against their imagination, this ignorance renders them decisive, dogmatic, imperious, and even exasperates them against all who oppose doubts to the reveries which they have begotten. What perplexity arises when it is required to solve an insolvable problem? unceasing meditation upon an object, impossible to understand, but in which, however he thinks himself much concerned, cannot but excite man and produce a fever in his brain. Let interest, vanity, and ambition cooperate ever so little with this unfortunate turn of mind, and society must necessarily be disturbed. This is the reason that so many nations have often been the scene of extravagances of senseless visionaries, who, believing their empty speculations to be eternal truths, and publishing them as such, have kindled the zeal of princes and their subjects, and made them take up arms for opinions represented to them as essential to the glory of the deity. In all parts of our globe, fanatics have cut each other's throats, publicly burnt each other, committed without a scruple and even as a duty the greatest crimes and shed torrents of blood. For what? To strengthen, support, or propagate the impertinent conjectures of some enthusiasts, or to give validity to the cheats of impostors in the name of a being who exists only in their imagination and who has made himself known only by the ravages, disputes, and follies he has caused. Savage and furious nations, perpetually at war, adore, under diverse names, some god, conformable to their ideas, that is to say, cruel, carnivorous, selfish, 
bloodthirsty. We find in all the religions a god of armies, a jealous god, an avenging god, a destroying god, a god who is pleased with carnage and whom his worshippers consider it a duty to serve. Lambs, bull, children, men and women are sacrificed to him. Zealous servants of this barbarous god think themselves obliged even to offer up themselves as a sacrifice to him. Madmen may everywhere be seen who, after meditating upon their terrible god, imagine that to please him they must inflict on themselves the most exquisite torments. The gloomy ideas formed of the deity, far from consoling them, have everywhere disquieted their minds and prejudiced follies destructive to happiness. How could the human mind progress while tormented with frightful phantoms and guided by men interested in perpetuating its ignorance and fears? Man has been forced to vegetate in his primitive stupidity. He has been taught stories about invisible powers upon whom his happiness was supposed to depend. Occupied solely by his fears and by unintelligible reveries, he has always been at the mercy of priests who have reserved to themselves the right of thinking for him and of directing his actions. Thus man has remained a slave without courage, fearing to reason, and unable to extricate himself from the labyrinth in which he has been wandering. He believes himself forced under the yoke of his gods, known to him only by the fabulous accounts given by his ministers, who, after binding each unhappy mortal in the chains of prejudice, remain his masters, or else abandon him defenseless in the absolute power of tyrants, no less terrible than the gods of whom they are the representatives. Oppressed by the double yoke of spiritual and temporal power, it has been impossible for the people to be happy. Religion became sacred, and men have had no other morality than what their legislators and priests brought from the unknown regions of heaven. The human mind, confused by theological opinions, ceased to know its own powers, mistrusted experience, feared truth and disdained reason in order to follow authority. Man has been a mere machine in the hands of tyrants and priests. Always treated as a slave, man has contracted the vices of slavery. Such are the true causes of the corruption of morals. Ignorance and servitude are calculated to make men wicked and unhappy. Knowledge, reason, and liberty can alone reform and make men happier. But everything conspires to blind them and to confirm their errors. Priests cheat them, tyrants corrupt and enslave them. Tyranny ever was and ever will be the true cause of man's depravity and also of his calamities. Almost always fascinated by religious fiction, poor mortals turn not their eyes to the natural and obvious causes of their misery, but attribute their vices to the imperfection of their natures, and their unhappiness to the anger of the gods. They offer to heaven vows, sacrifices, and presents to obtain the end of sufferings, which, in reality, are attributable only to the negligence, ignorance, and perversity of their guides, to the folly of their customs, and above all, to the general want of knowledge. Let men's minds be filled with true ideas, let their reason be cultivated, and there will be no need of opposing to the passions such a feeble barrier as the fear of gods. Men will be good when they are well instructed, and when they are despised for evil, or justly rewarded for good, which they do to their fellow citizens. In vain should we attempt to cure men of their vices, unless we begin by curing them of their prejudices. It is only by showing them the truth that they will perceive their true interests, and the real motives that ought to incline them to do good. Instructors have long enough fixed men's eyes upon heaven, 
Let them now turn them upon earth. An incomprehensible theology, ridiculous fables, impenetrable mysteries, puerile ceremonies are to be no longer endured. Let the human mind apply itself to what is natural, to intelligible objects, truth, and useful knowledge. Does it not suffice to annihilate religious prejudice, to show that what is inconceivable to man cannot be good for him? Does it require anything but plain common sense to perceive that a being incompatible with the most evident notions, that a cause continually opposed to the effects which we attribute to it, that a being of whom we can say nothing without falling into contradiction, that a being who, far from explaining the enigmas of the universe, only makes them more inexplicable, that a being whom for so many ages men have vainly addressed to obtain their happiness and the end of sufferings, does it require, I say, anything but plain common sense to perceive that the idea of such a being is an idea without model and that he himself is merely a phantom of the imagination? Is anything necessary but common sense to perceive, at least, that it is folly and madness for men to hate and damn one another about unintelligible opinions concerning a being of this kind? In short, does not everything prove that morality and virtue are totally incompatible with the notions of a god whom his ministers and interpreters have described in every country as the most capricious, unjust, and cruel of tyrants, whose pretended will, however, must serve as law and rule the inhabitants of the earth? To discover the true principles of morality, men have no need of theology, of revelation, or of gods. They have need only of common sense. They have only to commune with themselves, to reflect upon their own nature, to consider the objects of society and of the individuals who compose it. And they will easily perceive that virtue is advantageous and vice disadvantageous to themselves. Let us persuade men to be just, beneficent, moderate, sociable, not because such conduct is demanded by the gods, but because it is pleasant to men. Let us advise them to abstain from vice and crime, not because they will be punished in another world, but because they will suffer for it in this. These are, says Montesquieu, means to prevent crimes. These are punishments. These reform manners. These are good examples. The way of truth is straight. That of imposture is crooked and dark. Truth, ever necessary to man, must necessarily be felt by all upright minds. The lessons of reason are to be followed by all honest men. Men are unhappy only because they are ignorant. They are ignorant only because everything conspires to prevent their being enlightened. They are wicked only because their reason is not sufficiently developed. By what fatality, then, have the first founders of all sects given to their gods ferocious characters, at which nature revolts? Can we imagine a conduct more abominable than that which Moses tells us his god showed toward the Egyptians, where that assassin proceeds boldly to declare, in the name and by the order of his god, that Egypt shall be afflicted with the greatest calamities that can happen to man? Of all the different ideas which they give us of a supreme being, of a god, creator and preserver of mankind, there are none more horrible than those of the impostors, who represented themselves as inspired by a divine spirit, and thus saith the Lord. Why, O theologians, do you presume to inquire into the impenetrable mysteries of a being whom you consider inconceivable to the human mind? You are the blasphemers when you imagine that a being, perfect according to you, could be guilty of such cruelty towards creatures he has made out of nothing. Confess your ignorance of a creating God, 
and cease meddling with mysteries which are repugnant to common sense. End of preface. Recording by Roger Moline.